Games and war. War and games. One big topic, one trivial topic. But these two are strangely connected. Now this image here uh, is from the Collateral Murder video released by Wikileaks. It's most definitely not a game. If you've seen it, you were probably, uh, hopefully, shocked, as shocked as I, by the casual tone of the American soldiers in the helicopters, joking and laughing as they kill people on the ground, as if it were a computer game. Now this is not new. Some of the horrors of the First World War were ascribed to gentleman officers, armchair gen generals sitting in their rooms far from the front lines, pushing imaginary troops around on maps, with no concern for the real people whose lives were destroyed as a result. This image here is from a different kind of game. The game was called A Doomsday Eve, and it was played in Norway last weekend. Something very fresh. Now, this here is from the war room of the US government, circa 1983. And this here is a session of the Soviet Politburo, also some point in the 1980s. Now, these people, the Soviets and Americans, are pretending to be leaders of these two nations in the midst of a nuclear standoff. In part, this was a game of strategy, where Soviets and Americans tried to outmaneuver each other in nuclear brinkmanship. In part, it was one of diplomacy, between the two nations and inside each ruling elite. It was thoroughly researched. If, for example, the Americans came up with the idea that they would send weapons to rebels in, in Ingushetia, a bad word I barely can pronounce, they would write the order and they would fax it off to the CIA. Like so. Now, behind the scenes, five experts in history and politics figured out what the likely outcome of such an action would have been and they dispatched a corresponding fax to the head of the KGB. Now, there was one participant at this LARP who had played many strategy games, but never a live role-playing game such as this. After the game, he commented, I came prepared for the strategy and the diplomacy. And I got what I prepared for. But what took me by surprise was standing in the shower and worrying what would happen to my wife if nuclear war really breaks out. Now, this wife was imaginary, the wife of his character, and yet he cared for her. This is what live role-playing can do, that no other kind of game and art can. They can put you in the shoes of a different person, allow you to experience the world through his eyes, feel what he feels, do what he does. Now, in a way, they're not games in the traditional sense. You can't win them. They often have no, have no rules but improvisation. If the participants manage to convince each other that it is all real, they build and maintain an illusion of being someone else somewhere else, that alone is victory. Now, aside from the American and the Soviet war rooms, a doomsday eve contained a third group of characters. They were ordinary Norwegians, and they were celebrating Christmas Eve 1983, growing in increasingly tense and fearful from the ominous news on the radio. There was no strategy here, no diplomacy. Merely an ordinary family seeing their life approaching an end. Why do we play such things? What do we learn by doing so? I can't give you a full answer to that question. Neither can I give you a full answer to the question, what do games teach us about war? Because there is so much and so little. But I'll address some of the things we have seen in the last decade. Now, one lesson from a doomsday eve concerns why wars happen, how this can happen. Another player during the post-game debrief observed how the characters ended up obsessed with the logic of geopolitics and their own careers. They were moving missiles around on maps. Over here, over here. Yes, what if we take out that city? Forgetting the faces of the civilians beneath them. And for the players, these civilians were still present. It was much easier to press the button when the victims were faceless. And for leaders, they always are. As the collateral murder video shows, this effect is present in the real world. It takes either great callousness or great courage to stand face to face with another man and pull the trigger, much less so to give an order or press a button. Now, there are many, many LARPs about war, and for the most part, they treat war as entertainment, just as Hollywood movies do. They make war fun. There's the F word again, fun. Uh, they make it fun by getting rid of the nastiness, by not showing the widows and the orphans the hunger and the bloodshed. 
such LARPs and the wars they depict, they tap into emotions that are dangerously and universally human. Emotions that we LARPers recognize when we rush forward, rubber swords drawn towards the enemy, or huddle around the campfire during a long march. It's not just the adrenaline or the excitement, but the thirst for revenge and for glory. Destruction for the sake of destruction, and of being part of something much larger. These points were made very clearly by a Swedish law held in 2000 called the Tusen Rosarnas Väg, the Road of a Thousand Roses. In many ways, it appeared to be a typical medieval fantasy LARP. It featured two armies, the besiegers and the besieged, and they, it all led up to a climactic battle on the fortress walls. Now, as that is common as such LARPs, the participants felt a genuine sense of pride towards their imagined kingdoms, a patriotism that was made real by the brotherhood they felt while on the march or defending their home. For such experience unite us, whether we are role-playing or not. And for the besieging army, this fellowship found perfect expression in patriotic songs that had been written for their imagined kingdom by the organizers. They felt themselves to be the good guys. They sung these, sung these songs with all of their heart, and by the end of the game, they knew all of them. Now, imagine what went through the minds of these players when after the LARP was over, they were told that all of these songs were taken from the Hitler Jugend songbook. <laughs> they had been translated to Swedish, obviously, and only lightly edited. And in fact, the whole LARP was allegorical of World War II. And they felt themselves to be the good guys, had just played the role of the Axis. And we looked in the LARP in this perspective, it made sense. Now, I suppose they learned that lesson which has best been stated by Oscar Wilde, that patriotism is the virtue of the vicious. Another LARP. The year is 2001, and I'm about to end the LARP Europa. We are at a modern campsite in Norway. All the players are called in-game to the living room. When they see us, the organizers, they fall quiet. We've been gone for four days. When they are all there, we ask them to close their eyes and begin the countdown that ends the LARP. On the mental count of ten, you will open your eyes, you will be yourself again, and you will have left Europa. Now, what happened uh, as we did this countdown was that people began crying long before we had reached number ten. And they continued crying afterwards, and I think it was a solid hour until we saw the first smile. Now, this is not a normal LARP ending. Usually people, they cheer and they applaud and they start talking about what they did during the LARP. But the players at Europa had for the last four days pretend to be refugees from fictive Nordic war in the 90s, applying for asylum in a peaceful, democratic country on the Balkans. They had prepared by researching uh, and sometimes role-playing uh, the backstories of their characters, the stories of the war they had fled. For many of those players, recounting those memories during the LARP to faceless bureaucrats and incompetent reception center personnel, the memories, the trauma of civil war came to feel real. And the reception cell uh, center itself was modeled on those that received ex Yugoslav refugees in Norway in the 90s. When trauma meets an impenetrable bureaucracy, frustration ensues. Worse, it is a frustration that cannot be articulated, that meets no response but legalese, no promise but that of further unsatanity. The players at Europa stayed there for four days, frustrated they did not receive an answer to their asylum application. Now in Norway, it is not uncommon to wait for 18 months and still then live in uncertainty. At the end of Europa, we returned to the reality that we had role-played in. The suffering we had experienced was not real. Or rather, it was limited those four days. But now it was no longer the suffering of those characters. It was the suffering of the people who pass on the street every day and who many of us could no longer ignore. But the hardest lesson of Europa came earlier, at the mini-LARP held for some of the players who were to join the final LARP. Prologue, as it was called, depicted scenes from the war. In the final scene, 
uh, the characters were subjected to brutal interrogation. Now, the purpose of the interrogators was not simply to obtain information, but to spread terror, to ensure that those who survived would never come back and that they would spread the word to everybody of their same nationality, making sure that this area would be emptied. It was ethnic cleansing. After the players were debriefed, individually and collectively. We had a very tight safety system around this. And the players had no problem with the experience. But we did not debrief the players of the paramilitaries, the guards, the perpetrators, because they were organizers. They weren't players. And it turns out that they were the ones who were truly in need of debriefing, truly in need of having their experience expressed and acknowledged. And this is a lesson we have learned many times since then. It is not really the victims of role-played cruelty who usually need consolation. The prison guards, the officers, the torturists. Why? Now, the tales from such role-playing experiences are not always coherent. But there is a common denominator. A disturbing joy at committing cruelty and a powerful hunger for more. An increasing willingness and creativity to inflict ever more suffering on their hapless victims. While the suffering is mostly role-played, the bloodlust of the oppressor is not. It arises from inside you. Role-playing is merely the catalyst. To borrow Nietzsche's aphorism, these players stare into the abyss and recoil as the abyss stares back at them. They recognize in themselves the potential for immense cruelty. And that is very frightening indeed. It is no mystery for us then how Abu Ghraib could have happened. Unfortunately, when we look at the smiling US soldiers in the pictures, I wish we could just turn it away as something done by some rotten apples in a foreign army, we see people like ourselves in a situation where that inner beast has been allowed to run free. And that, I believe, is one of the things that role-playing can teach us about war, that we are them, or rather that we have the capability to be them. We can be the general who sends young men off to die, or turns a blind eye to atrocity. We can be the soldier who fulfills his duty with pride and with hatred. The civilian who will never forgive and never forget, not because he doesn't want to, but because he can't. Wars happen because we're human, because we have these capabilities inside us. But there is also some hope here. A doomsday eve did not, in fact, end the nuclear war. A good scientist, Russian, had burned the car with the nuclear launch codes, making launch impossible for the Soviet leadership, who anyway in the building. The Americans at DEFCON 1 reconsidered at the last moment. This effect, the urge to do the right thing at the expense of dramaturgy, at the expense of character, has been called a LARP democracy, and it is a well-known problem, because if you try to organize doomsday, then it doesn't happen. But the persistence of this problem also shows us that we do have the capa capability and the desire to do what is right, rather than what is required of us. The capability to use an illegal order, to recognize the beast before it is allowed to run free. And most importantly, role-playing can do, teach us to see beyond the maps, and the buttons, and the uniforms, and skin color, and the yearning for revenge, and for glory, to look at the face of the enemy and see that they, too, are us. Thank you.